Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is election day in Virginia and New Jersey, and I'm guessing, because it's early, that uh, today will be in Washington, D.C., Democrats in disarray day all day long, uh, starting with what was supposed to be the day that they voted on the big infrastructure bill. Kind of amazing infrastructure week continues from one administration to another. But the the assumption was the House Democrats were supposed to vote this week on on uh, two things, the $1 trillion infrastructure package uh, that got 69 votes in the Senate, and then also the $1.75 trillion social spending bill that uh, the president announced, at least announced the, the, the framework uh, last last week. That, that vote didn't take place last week because uh, progressives uh, said we're not going to vote on that until we have absolute rock-solid assurances that uh, that our bigger bill is going to pass. Uh, they won't vote on the the bipartisan bill until the the social spending bill uh, would pass, and uh, they you know were demanding a much firmer commitment from Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. They would vote for it. The vibes certainly were that they were on board. That was certainly the word from the White House. That was certainly what Joe Biden implied on Thursday morning. But he had to leave town empty-handed which means that uh, Terry McAuliffe goes into today's election empty-handed. And then yesterday, uh, while the president is still in Europe, Joe Manchin holds a press conference. And, I, you know, it, it's always hard. I try not to get sucked into the, the daily navel-gazing back-and-forth kabuki dances, to mix my metaphors, uh, around these things. But it did feel like Joe Manchin... Um, sort of drove by and threw a Molotov cocktail into the whole thing. So here's Joe Manchin uh, laying out, uh, rather frustrated, openly frustrated Joe Manchin. Uh, This is what he had to say yesterday. To be clear, I will not support the reconciliation legislation without knowing how the bill will impact our debt and our economy and our country. And we won't know that until we work through the text. For the sake of our country, again, and I am urging... Mm-hmm. All of my colleagues in the House to vote and pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill. It's bipartisan, 69 votes. We worked on that for many, many months. As I've said before, holding that bill hostage is not going to work to get my support of what you want. It's what we should all agree on and work through the process. I'm open to supporting a final bill that helps move our country forward, but I'm equally open to voting against a bill that hurts our country. And I've been very clear about that also. And most importantly, hurts go. every American. There you go. Let's work together. Yeah. And I mean that. Let's all work together on getting a sensible reconciliation package, a package that really strengthens our nation and makes us better and leads the world. And there you have it. Boom. So I think it's safe to say that there's not going to be a vote in the House today. The White House is still saying it's confident that we'll have mansion support. But here we are once again. It feels like it's kind of Groundhog Day here. So on this D-Day, Democrats in disarray all day, uh, we are joined by our good friend Peter Weiner, who is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, contributing writer at The Atlantic, author of The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. Uh, Peter, welcome back on the podcast. It's great to be with you, Charlie. It's always a pleasure, and I love the podcast. So thanks for having me on. This is, I just mentioned to you a few minutes ago, this is your eighth appearance on the podcast. And, you know, you wrote about, you know, how to how to heal our frayed republic after Trump, and here we are after yeah. Trump. And uh, <laughs> republic feels more frayed than ever. I don't know how it feels to you. Yeah, boy, that project's really going well, isn't it? Um, I didn't say when the republic would be healed. I only said at some point it uh, it will be healed. Look, uh, I think uh, America is fractured, and I think our politics is fractured. I think, as you said, the Democratic Party is in disarray and and in a lot of uh, of trouble. Just to to, to speak to actually both the the issues that you raise, which is the the Virginia election and and then the comments by by Manchin, I think I would disaggregate them. Uh, Let me deal with the Manchin one first and then then, uh, the the Virginia governor's race. That one, I I suspect, is largely Manchin just letting off steam. Um, He's not happy with this false urgency of House Democrats, and he thinks the process is moving too fast and and too carelessly. But he seems amenable uh, to ending up somewhere around $1.75 trillion, which is where that um, House is headed. 
the process has been rough and messy for sure. Uh, and Biden's done a poor job of, of helping. But I think they have a pretty decent shot at, at passing a bill that they'll call the, the Build Back Better bill and passing the infrastructure bill, which, which uh, as Manjin said, it cleared, cleared the Senate. So nobody's going to really remember the process of this. Um, they're going to remember the, the results. So that one, I, I, I think, is part of the optics, but probably not in any fundamental sense uh, a, pro- a problem for Democrats. The Virginia race, if, if Youngkin wins and, and McAuliffe loses, I think that's a different, uh, that's a different uh, order of magnitude because th- that is going to send reverberations throughout the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, and you know, it's, I'm sure you've discussed with, with other people in the podcast yeah. I and mean, Biden won that's the Virginia by 10 points. Uh, we all know about the history of Virginia, which is contrary in, in the year after of presidential elections. Nonetheless, it's been a state that's been trending democratic. And if young can, can, can win, I think that that will foreshadow some, some real problems for the Democrats in the 20, uh, uh 22 midterms. So that, I think I would be more alarmed by uh, than, than, than what's happened with Manchin. Yeah, I, I think we can count on that being um, uh, analyzed pretty much to death, which we, of course, will do here on the podcast as well. Like, so, Peter, you're, you're a veteran of three administrations, Reagan's, you know, Bush 41, Bush 43. I'm trying to remember a similar situation where a political party played political chicken the way the Democrats are right now. Look, I, I know the Republicans have had all kinds of problems with their Freedom Caucus, but uh, you know, watching uh, the you know a faction of the party threaten to torpedo essentially the sign you know one of the signature legislative accomplishments of their own president, and, and doing this kind of weird link up thing. I'm not going to pass this bill unless we pass that bill. That strikes me as as an unusual development. I mean, we've talked before about dysfunctional Congresses, uh, gridlock, but this is sort of internal gridlock of the Democratic Party with itself. Yeah, I think that's a fair that's a fair analysis, and I think that that's consistent with with how the Democratic Party often often is. And I think these days the Democratic Party is much more of a coalition, disparate coalition than the Republican Party is, which really uh, is much more in, in lockstep. I do think that what's unusual here is that this is Biden's first year. That's what's really unusual. I mean, we in the in the George W. Bush presidency, it was really Republicans who sabotaged the immigration bill in the yes. uh, in the second term. Uh, and that was a pretty significant piece of legislation from, from our perspective and from the perspective of the country. Uh, so there've been other cases in which a party has, has undermined, uh, it's, uh, a president mm-hmm. of its own party. But I do take your point, which is this is still the first year. And normally there's a tremendous amount of deference. Now, again, let's see what happens. I suspect you're going to get both of those legislative achievements, both the infrastructure bill and the build back better, um, legislation as well. And if, if that's the case, you know, he's going to be able to chalk those up in terms of wins. But um, but just because you get a legislative win uh, doesn't mean that it's going to help you politically. It depends on what the effects on the, on the country will be. But there is no doubt that these are factions uh, within the Democratic Party. The progressive left is, is getting more vocal uh, and exercising their, 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 their muscle, so to speak more often. And Joe Manchin is a Democrat from West Virginia and he's just not moving and neither is Kristen Cinema. So that the result is, uh, is conflict. No, I, I, I think your analysis, uh, is, is right. I was listening to, and I was watching Joe Manchin and I think that he was, he was blowing off some steam. I think he was very frustrated at what happened on Thursday. Um, and he's, he's really kind of firing a shot across the bow of the progressives who were blocking that, that, that vote, whether that translates into his vote or not, I don't know. Um, but if Democrats were hoping that, uh, this was going to be the week where they were going to one, two, bump, bump, uh, you know, pass this, that, that seems less likely. Okay. So I don't want to get bogged down into that because a lot of, a lot of other people, as in everyone else, uh, <laughs> will be talking about this, that story. I wanted to go more deeply into something that you and I have been discussing for years now, um, which is what the hell happened to, to Christians in terms of their politics. And, I have, I, I'm sure that you and I have talked about this before, you know, w- when the Trump phenomenon took place back in 2016, I, I understood a lot of what was happening. I, I think perhaps I understood less than I thought I did at the time in retrospect, 
But the one thing that just I, I have, have had such a difficult time coming around, getting my head around, is watching the way in which evangelical Christians turn themselves on their heads um, in terms of character and morality, uh, personal ethics and all of that. And I know that you have been writing about this and obviously are still continuing to explore it, but I wanted to talk to you about this piece you did for The Atlantic, um, where you talked to dozens of folks, pastors, theologians, academics, and historians. And so you're still trying to get to the bottom of this as well. What's going on for the church? And, and I think the, the reason it's so important, and, and I, I become more and more focused on this, is that even after Trump leaves, this whole universe remains. And I made this point to JVL yesterday. You know, it's the problem on the right is, is not the leaders, it's the followers. It, it is the base itself. And and if, if, in fact, our entire electorate has been changed and our culture has been changed, then you're not going to simply be able to replace one political leader with another. So t- talk to me a little bit about this. I mean, you you describe yourself as a person of Christian faith. You've spent most of your adult life attending evangelical churches. And you wrote that you did that piece because you wanted to understand the splintering of churches, communities, and relationships. And uh, your piece was described as an anguished look at the, at the state of the Christian church. And the interviews you have in there paint a picture th- that, and this this I found r- really new to me because I'm, I'm looking at it from the outside. You you paint a picture of an evangelical movement that is particularly vulnerable to politicization. Could you talk about that? Because that that was something that I don't think that I would have seen prior to the rise of Trump. So why was the evangelical church so vulnerable to politicization? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and, um, and it was a piece that, that, that there's some pain in, in describing this for me because I'm a person of the Christian faith. That's I think, the most central thing to, to my life. And, and the reason why I say that there's some amount of pain is um, if, if you've made Christianity central to your life and you're watching those who claim to follow Jesus do so much, in, in my estimation, to distort who he really is, um, that deformed image of him. Uh, even if it's unwitting, um, is, is is a difficult thing, and I think it really has a real cost. I think it has a real cost to the faith, as well as a cost to our to our political system. Um, I should get in a caveat, which is an important one, which is uh, the evangelical church is a, is a huge movement. There are eighty or hundred million people. It's depending on which surveys you you trust, and and so it encompasses a huge amount of people with a, with a wide diversity of opinion. However, having said that, there's no question that the evangelical movement is the core of the Republican Party and is really the core base of, of Donald Trump, or at least a pillar of the Trumpian MAGA world base. And how it got there is a long and complicated story. Uh, maybe just as a, as a starting point, I would say that it turned out that um, I think that the uh, many people within the evangelical movement they're sort of tribalistic instincts, which have always existed, and I suppose all of us have them to one degree or another, really it became overwhelming. There was a movement that way um, pre-Donald Trump, long before he came on the scene, when evangelicals waded into the political waters. You're familiar with the history. It was really in the late mm-hmm. 70s and early 80s with the moral majority. I think the more they waded into the waters, that they ended up very much in the in the deep end, and they became um, sort of enveloped by politics. And it turned out that the I, I think that the evangelical movement is held together more by political orientation and sociology than a common theology. I think that is the key thing to understand. Um, one of the people I quoted, Mark Laberton, is the president of Fuller Seminary, which is one of the leading seminaries in the United States said that it's really sociology, not Christology, that, yeah. is, that is defining in a lot of ways. And I think that that's just important to understand. It's what I have discovered, I, I think I knew it before, but what's been underscored in very vivid ways to me is that when it comes to, for a lot of Christians, again, not all, but for a lot of Christians, a lot of evangelical, what's core to their identity um, is politics, culture, and sociology more than faith. I don't think that they're aware of that, I think that they believe that faith is primus inter pares for them, first among equals. And and they believe they're trying to interpret politics through the prism of faith, 
But from my perspective, it's very much the opposite. It's an inversion that has happened. And politics has become a, a, uh, the interpretive lens. And faith is sort of an instrument to be used to advance these very deeply held cultural attitudes. So you describe this hollowness in the evangelical movement that uh, Trump was able to exploit to add open hatred and resentments to the political religious stance of the true believers. And I think this is the part that I really still struggle with is, is how, how did Christians, people who think of them as Christians, come to see a gospel, this is your word, have come to see a gospel of hatreds, resentments, vilifications, put downs, and insults as expressions of their Christianity for which they too should be willing to fight. I mean, wow, uh, talk about uh, an inversion. Yeah. I and mean, I can imagine becoming a militant Christian, but how did Christianity become that? I mean, this is not the meek shall inherit the earth version. Yeah, I, I agree. I'd make a, a broad point and then a, and maybe a more narrow one uh, to, to this moment. The broader point I would make is that, unfortunately, the history of the Christian church you now for 2000 years is just very mixed. I mean, there have been moments of, of grandeur and glory and huge advancements in human rights and human dignity. And there have been moments of, of, of horror. Uh, you, you look at the, at, you know, in the in the 20th century, the Rwandan Civil War, which Rwanda is overwhelmingly Christian, or the the Nazi Church. You know, why why was Dietrich Bonhoeffer s such a hero uh, for, for for so many people within Christianity? It's because he stood almost alone, not completely, but almost alone, against the Nazification of the of the German National Church. You know, in the 1930s, you could go on and on. So. The, the reality is that, that that Christians throughout history have been prone to uh, terrible mistakes, just like the rest of, of, of humanity, non-Christians, and it's got a mixed record. Now, in terms of what's going on in the here and now, let's say American evangelicals and, 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 and those, those attitudes that, that, uh, that you just described, um, I would say that it's a combination of, of things. One is I think there have been a huge uh, amount of grievances and resentments that have built over the years. Some of them understandable. Um, some of them, I think, overstated. Uh, when I say understandable, because there's no question in my mind, that there's a, an elite culture that looked down on people of the Christian faith, or at least mm -hmm. people of a certain kind of Christian faith, evangelicals, um, and it was patronizing and condescending. Um, and They've been on the receiving end of that. They uh, didn't like it. Um, they internalized it. And I think it built over time. Now, I think even if you're on the receiving end of that, the response is not to be filled with grievance and, and, and resentments. That is not what the gospel calls people to. But human nature will often lead you in that direction. So I think that part of it is this growing grievances and resentments. And Trump tapped into that. And what happened is it was initially, I mean, I'm guessing you had these conversations, Charlie, right around, mm -hmm. you know, the latter half of 2015, early 2016. Yep. And I'm guessing that in your conversations like mine, you began to see something that began as a bug become a feature. That is initially they said, look, I'm going to support him because of the courts and because of his stand on abortion and so forth and so on, which is an arguable position. I didn't share it, but I understood right. it. But over time, and this was the concern that, that I had, I was ringing this bell in 2015, you were ringing it too, which was, if you do this, if, if, you, if you hitch your wagon to Donald Trump, he's going to change you, you're not going to change him. And that's what happened. And I think what happened for a lot of evangelical Christians is they saw Trump's attitude, his style of politics, his disposition, the cruelty, the crudity, the aggression, the refusal to apologize and that sort of hit a psychic note with them where they said, you know, we're really pissed at these people. They've mistreated us. And we finally got a guy who's going to fight. I heard that time and time again. Oh, yeah. He's he's a fighter. So I think that's over one over thing. Again. Yeah. The other thing I would say is fear. This is a kind of existential fear. Again, I think it's overstated. I think they're real threats, uh, uh, depending on what you're talking about for the culture and elsewhere in American society. So I don't think they're manufactured whole cloth. But the degree to which when you talk to people in the evangelical movement, that there's a sense that we're, you know, two minutes to midnight about to, to, to fall off a cliff 
that these, you know, that, that our opponents want to destroy our country, us, our children, I know. Uh, you know, the ends justify the means. Because when you feel like there's an existential threat and everything you know and love is under attack and under assault, then that will drive you to some, some pretty dangerous places. So I think there, there are more reasons, but I think those two things are central grievances and resentment and existential fear. So also in this built-in vulnerability of the movement, uh, you write that evangelicals are some of the most anti-institutional um, believers among um, among the religious believers. So talk to me a little bit about that, that anti-institutional tendency. You, you said it makes them more prone to insider abuse and outsiderism. Talk to me about that. Yeah, sure. That, that insight came from Tim Tim Keller, is really one of the most prominent evangelical figures in 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 the in the country, in the world, actually. And he was the founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church. He's he's now retired. Um, and he, my piece was was really you know heavily reported. So the insights mm-hmm. that are in it are really just me channeling these these wise people. Mm-hmm. But Tim was the one who said that the evangelical movement flourished in a kind of relatively anti institutional country at an anti-institutional time, and that the churches themselves, much more so uh, than, than, than uh, Catholic and, 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 and Jewish and mainline Presbyterian churches, uh, have this anti-institutional um, history to, to them. And that can be uh, helpful in one respect, which is the capacity for evangelical churches to grow rapidly is, is, has shown itself to be much higher than many mainline denominations because they can adjust to culture in a certain certain way. But those anti-institutional tendencies also um, make evangelical communities more prone to, to, to what Tim referred to as insider abuse, which is corruptions committed by leaders and there are almost no guardrails. And it's kind of outsiderism in which evangelicals refuse to let the church form them or their beliefs. Hmm. So uh, basically they are compared to other faith communities, largely unrooted. And when you're unrooted, you become susceptible to certain things. And in this case, the idolization of politics, some fanatical ideas, and some conspiracy theories. So I, th- that's yeah. been a history of evangelicalism. It works for you and against you. I think it's working against them in this present moment. So on this hollowness, again, you had, you had a religious book publisher who told you that the the evangelical church had failed to turn adherents into disciples because they had a you know major massive failure of catechism. Is this because they were focused on entertainment, something else, filling the pews, and somehow they never got around to teaching these evangelical Christians what Christianity really was? I mean, is it really that that's that significant a failure that many of them just didn't know? Yeah, I think a couple of things happened. I, yeah, the, the, that that came up actually in, in the interviews that I did. The catechism, this process of instructing and informing people through teaching, um, as a source of, of of the problem. And um, yeah, so I think a couple of things happened. One was that there is this massive discipleship failure um, because people really were not being formed in the deepest parts of who they were in terms of of, of their Christian faith. And some of it was entertainment and, uh, and a sort of shallowness uh, that, uh, that took over. And then on top of that, an Alan Jacobs, who's, who's a wonderful professor of humanities at Baylor, talked about these uh, technologies and platforms for catechizing that exist today that we didn't have a generation or two ago. Uh, television we did, but talk radio, Facebook, Twitter, podcasts, on and on. And I've seen this again, I think I'm guessing you have too, which is, you know, the point is a kind of feedback loop. People are listening to, if you're talking about evangelicals, you're dealing mostly with people obviously on the, on the American right. Uh, So you're listening 20, 25 hours a week, potentially to talk radio, to Fox news, to OAN. They're reading, you know, the, the, the the federalist uh, or American greatness. They're getting this information for you know, each week, a huge amount of that information. If you're at a church, you know, you get maybe depending on what church you go to, 25 minute sermon. Maybe these these people go to an adult education class. Maybe some of them have a Bible study every other week or or something like that. And when you put that together in terms of 
forming, you know, the, the sensibilities and the order of the laws, um, that it's just one sided. And I think what's happened is that this kind of catechism from, from, from the culture, from the political culture mm -hmm. has been nonstop and very powerful. Um, and that's kind of shaped who, what people's identity is. And faith has become more as, as, as one person a couple of years referred to it, uh, to me as, as a kind of hood ornament. This is extraordinary. I mean, this, the, the catechism of, by cable television, you want to know how, how bad things are, but this, uh, the Baylor professor you just mentioned, uh, told you, um, is, you know, that, that catechesis, is that how you pronounce the word? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, come, comes not from the churches, but from the media they consume or rather the media that consume them. The right. churches have barely better than a snowball's chance in hell of shaping most people's lives. So yeah. that, I mean, that's the imbalance right now, um, that the churches, that the churches face. And apparently they've, they've made their peace with it. Some yes, of them, or some, some, of them. Of, some of them have made their peace. The others, uh, who have not made their peace with it. Uh, I mean, I talked to, you know, uh, I don't know, 15 or more pastors for, for, for this piece. Many of them are not comfortable with that. What's happened. They haven't made their peace with it. They just don't know what to do about it. Charlie, they are at wit's end. I mean, a lot of these people, um, it's interesting. One of the, I guess the sub topics that came up in, in, in this Atlantic essay was a long one was the crisis in the American pastorship, the ministers, um, people who are seeing their congregations blown apart, divided by politics and culture in ways that, um, yeah. is not what they want and has got great grief and pain to these ministers. Um, because they they got into they wanted to be a minister because they cared about the, the gospel and about and and about hermeneutics and you know preaching about Matthew five and Philippians two, but what they've experienced is that what's galvanizing um, these um, a lot of these people in the churches um, are is politics and and a friend of mine who's actually uh, in, in in Bellevue Presbyterian Church in, in Bellevue mm -hmm. Washington where where I'm visiting for a few days and doing, doing some events out here, Scott Dudley, he referred to uh, what he, re his term was the idolatry of, of politics. Yeah. But this is what he told me something was really, um, I thought it was a very helpful formulation. He said, he's heard of many congregants who leave their church because it didn't match their politics, but he's never once heard of someone changing their politics because it didn't match the church's teaching. And I thought that was a very helpful formulation it gets it exactly what we're talking about. Well, you talk to uh, more than a dozen pastors and and cite this uh, Christian polling firm's r result that 29% of pastors have given real consideration to leaving the ministry within the past year. So, I mean, the the uh, the, the warring inside congregations is 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 intense. And you quote one former pastor saying he felt betrayed in his congregation. The gentleness of Jesus was utterly discarded. He told Weiner. Yeah, I must. I, yeah, it was a, that was a, that was a tough conversation, um, uh, and and he, it was interesting when I spoke with him. He he was not bitter; he was just sad, mostly, and hurt uh, by by what had uh, what had happened. Partly because in what he was describing to me is that the people who turned on him for political and cultural reasons were people that he was close to within the church. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't as if these, these were sort of outsiders or people that he never had a relationship with. It was that he had this relationship and politics was so powerful that all the other stuff that had gone into the investment of that human relationship seemed to have been jettisoned. And, and he told me that they don't care about the relational collateral damage. And when Interesting. Christians don't care about the just, collateral damage to human relationships, something has gone amiss. So you actually opened this piece with this anecdote about a mega church in Northern Virginia, the McLean Bible Church. Tell me what happened there. A group went after the pastor who was a, who was a, a conservative guy, um, accusing him of wokeness. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. His, his name is David Platt. He's a 43-year-old minister at McLean Bible and um, was kind of rock star. I mean, he was a very well-known pastor um, and joined at McLean Bible um, a couple of years ago after following somebody named Lon Solomon, who had been there for, for, for many, many years. 
And what had happened was that there was an election of elders, uh, which is normally not an important or significant event, and it's often a unifying event in a, in a church. But you have to get 75%, in this case, for, for, for McLean Bible, 75% of the vote um, to get these three elders in. And uh, make a long story short, there was a campaign, uh, according to Platt, uh, to, to mislead uh, the congregants to vote against these elders, spreading uh, completely uh, unsupportive conspiracy. Well, conspiracy theories are by definition not not supported. Conspiracy theories, for example, saying that these elders would advocate selling the church building to Muslims who would convert it to a mosque. This was going on just as the vote was about to take to, to take place, um, and so a lot of misinformation was being thrown about to try and keep these these uh, elders from being voted in. Uh, um, people who were not members of the church apparently were were were, uh, were voting. So they did an election a couple of weeks later. The three elders were put in, but what this did is revealed a tremendous amount of divisions, and there are people within McLean Bible who were going after David Platt uh, for being, um, yeah, left of center, social justice, because he's, he's, he's taken on the issue of, of, of race and, and, and justice. Now, David Platt, whatever you, you, you think of him, uh, and I don't know him, I've, I've, I've mm-hmm. never met him, he is a utterly orthodox, conservative, evangelical on doctrine. I mean, this, so when you begin to say that, you know, he is, uh, he's being subsumed by wokeness, and this is the same thing has been said about Russell Moore and 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 Beth Moore, not, and, not related, uh, and Stetzer, yeah, not related, um, who's who's the executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center and so forth. It's like hmm. if you don't agree with a with a politics, they all of a sudden become progressive Christian figures who are championing leftist ideologies and. Uh, when when that is happening, when these kind of figures, Matt Chandler is another person who's 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 conservative and orthodox, who's who's been accused of this kind of stuff. It just tells you what is going on in the churches and what's animating a lot of people. Again, not all people, but at least in some cases, a vocal minority of people is that they are very alert to this notion that of of progressivism and wokeness and that it's somehow going to destroy the church. But I think what's really, again, behind this is that for for them, the core identity is political, cultural, sociological, not, not faith. So one of the things that really jumped out at me from your piece that I thought was a really important insight was the Southernization of the church. Uh, you, You had a pastor in North Carolina tell you that some of the distinctive cultural forms present in the American South, things like masculinity, male dominance, tribal loyalties, obedience and intolerance, and even the ideology of white supremacism have spread to other parts of the country. So you're, you're, one of the theses is that the Southern culture has had this profound impact on evangelical religion, which does explain a lot, or at least seems to. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that's uh, the pastor there is Claude Alexander, a senior pastor at Park Church uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and and Claude is a is a very well regarded um, pastor. He's an uh, African American, again, very you know orthodox and, and and solid by the lights of most evangelicals. But he had this insight about uh, about the the, the the American South, and you know he made it clear that these attitudes aren't aren't shared by every Southerner or dominant throughout the South, but they are, exist, and he felt like they needed to be named. And the way that he put it is that Southern cultures had a profound impact on religion, particularly evangelical religion. And our mutual friend David uh, French, who lives in Franklin County, mm-hmm. Tennessee, which is very very conservative, um, he's he's written about the shame honor culture in the South. Um, and you know, what, what David has said is you're seeing an explosion out of, of, of godly um, Christian passion, but this kind of ancient Southern shame, honor, rage. What I'll say about that, again, with a caveat that this doesn't speak, obviously, for, for everyone in the South, but there are tendencies that regions of the country have, and those, those do exist. It's also a reminder, and here, this is true of all of us, and this is true of, of, of myself as well. We're all formed and shaped by our experiences, family of origin, 
the, 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 the teachers that we've around, the communities that we're a part of, the re- regions of the country that we're a part of. And they shape us in ways that we, we just aren't aware of. And I think part of it is because it's like a fish in water. You know, it's just the way it is. You can see those tendencies in other people much easier than you can see them in yourself. And, and I struggle with this too. I mean, I, I feel like I can see confirmation bias in others. It's just harder for me to see it in myself, which is partly why you need to surround yourself. I need to surround myself with people whom I trust, who can speak into my life, and who do have views that are different than mine or willing to say that. Um, so it, it's a reminder. Um, I, there is a, Somebody told me in this, in this piece, I think it was Christian Demez, actually, who wrote this really fascinating book called uh, Jesus and, and John Wayne. And she, mm-hmm. she made a, a point w- which I thought identified uh, this um, well. She said, more than most other Christians, that conservative evangelicals, they insist that they're rejecting cultural influences, right? I mean, I'm sure you've, you've experienced yeah. that all the time. In fact, their faith is profoundly shaped by cultural and political values. And, uh, and uh, they're, they're just not aware of it. They, they think they're coming to reading the scriptures, you know, almost like a tabula rosa. They're just seeing it the way it was written. But in fact, we all carry with us presuppositions and assumptions in how we interpret things. And I do think that for some part of, of, of the evangelical world, that southernization, some of the characteristics of the South that still exist, are there. And the point Claude was making is that is spreading to other regions of the country as well. Well, this explained something to me, which I have really been um, struck by, which is the, this whole uh, cult of rugged masculinity and testosterone, which, which is playing such a major role on the right, but also clearly um, among evangelical Christians, you, you have the, you quote uh, one of the people you talked to saying the American evangelicals have worked for decades to replace the Jesus of the gospels with an idol of rugged masculinity and Christian nationalism. And Trump represents the fulfillment rather than the betrayal of many of white evangelicals, most deeply held values because, you know, part of this is this belief, which I have to say I'm not that familiar with, that God ordained men to be the protectors and filled them with testosterone for this purpose. While women are seen as nurturers, so for years men have been expected to exhibit boldness and ruthlessness in the face of situations the church has deemed as dire. Well, when you understand that, pieces start to click together, don't they? Yeah, they they do. That you're exactly right. Mm-hmm. That was Kristen Demez, and and uh, this was you know Jesus and John Wayne. Her argument was that mm-hmm. John Wayne, for a lot of people in, in in the evangelical world, became a kind of model of what it meant to be a man, to be Jeez. masculine, even a Christian person of uh, of faith. But this was not a betrayal that came out of uh, out of the Gospels. Um, this was a betrayal, uh, a portrayal of. Of, of a different kind of view of masculinity, but it was the conjoining of that view and, and basically saying that this is synonymous with, with a biblical view of, of manhood. And she made a, a uh, interesting point, additional uh, interesting point, which is she said the fruits of the spirit, which are in the New Testament epistle, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control are deemed um, as feminine virtues. Yes. Well, of course, in the scriptures, they're not. No, those are those are what are to identify people who are followers of Jesus. But it is true that again, in some segments within evangelical world and the Christian world, those are not seen as male uh, male virtues. And uh, you know, it's a complicated issue. I mean, it's it's too no. complicated to go into in terms of there's this debate about complementarian versus egalitarian and of the role of women in 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 the church. And I certainly know people who are the so-called complementarian view, who uh, who are very decent and don't have any of the sort of toxic masculinity um, associated with them. They just believe that this is the correct interpretation of of scripture. But there is, and I, I think you've seen this particularly from what I can tell in the Southern Baptist Convention, the the one that basically ran out Russell Moore and and Beth Moore, as you said, they're they're they're, they're unrelated. But there, there's, there's re- the Southern Baptist Convention is being roiled by controversy, and some of it is because there are some group of older white men that have dominated the Southern Baptist Convention now for a couple of decades, 
And I really do believe that they've sort of jumped the tracks and gone from what could be a defensible complementarian view, um, or le- yeah, at least it was defensible. And that, in, in fact, became a kind of Trojan horse. They had certain attitudes of patriarchy and masculinity and this toxic masculinity, and they dressed it up as, as, as in Christian garb. And, and a lot of that has gone on. And that explains why there's been a lot of alienation, particularly among younger people who are watching this unfold and say, this is a kind of moral freak show. I don't want anything to, to, to do with it. And, and it's, that's an understandable reaction if, if you judged faith simply on what's playing out in, um, you know, uh, uh, with, with, a lot of, uh, with a lot of denominations right now. Well, how do you turn this around? You argue in the piece that Jesus of the gospel needs to be reclaimed. How? How will that happen? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think it's both a sh- long answer and a short answer. I mean, I would s- say, Charlie, just from my own perspective, um, as a person of the Christian faith, that ultimately you have to have more people whose hearts um, and loves and affections for, for, for Jesus um, is just deeper. Um, and that he really does become the model and the order of our loves gets reshaped. Of course, the question becomes, you know, how does that happen? Um, some of it is the catechesis. It's, it's the churches being intentional. I, I do think that a lot of churches, I've, I've been on various conferences and gatherings with Christian thought leaders, pastors and seminary presidents and writers and so forth, who are really grappling in this with, with good conscience. And, um, you know, there is such a thing as a public theology. And I think that the church has really dealt itself out of the game in terms of this public theology, which is how are people of faith supposed to engage in culture and politics in a way that's not partisan and is responsible? You know, Martin Luther King Jr. had a lovely phrase when he said that um, the church shouldn't be a servant um, of the state or a master of the state, but the conscience of the state. Hmm. And, um, and that kind of thinking of what it means to be the conscience of the state is important, but I I do think that, that part of it is that ultimately people have to want to be part of communities where their identity in faith communities is really with the Lord they claim to follow and love. That it's not these other things. Now this is tricky because it, you know when you a lot of it is just the, the the nature of the conversations you have. But one thing that I've learned over the years is. You can't overwhelm people or pummel them or out argue them out of positions when their core identity is at stake. Uh, people need, and this is true of me. I mean, if somebody came straight at me, it's something that was core to who I am. I'm sure I would fight back. I'm sure I would be resistant to it. I think a lot of it just on an individual level is having relationships in which people feel heard and listened to and understood. Um, and they don't feel like, like, uh, like they're, they're under attack. I also have some amount of hope um, that the younger generation ha- has seen this and have really been turned off and want to create something better and higher and 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 more noble um, out of uh, out of faith. I think that this is going to run its way out over time. I, I just think a lot of this is generational. There's an older group of people who have defined publicly what what Christianity and politics and culture, a certain template. And, um, I mean, my hope is, is that younger people are going to come in who are faithful, but are going to say, look, there's just not, uh, there's not, um, enough grace. One of my favorite contemporary Christian authors is Philip Yancey wrote a book years ago in the 1990s called what's so amazing about grace. And he said, that he would go around and ask people in airports and other settings. He's writing the books. When I mentioned mm. Christians or evangelicals, what's the words that come to your mind <laughs> most often? And he said they were usually anti words, mm-hmm. uh, anti homosexuality, anti abortion. They were culture war words. He said he never once heard somebody say grace. And grace for a person of the Christian faith is. Uh, you know, bullseye center of what the faith is about. And if what's happening is that isn't being conveyed by the people who claim to be the followers of that faith, then something has, has, has gone radically wrong. But when you see grace, like you did at the AME church five years ago, when Dylan Roof killed those, those, Mm -hmm. those families. And, and the, you, you remember like 48 hours afterwards, there was the arraignment hearing and these people 
looked at the person who amazing, killed yeah. the people whom they loved and cherished and through tears said, I forgive you. I sent a link of that moment to a friend of mine who's an atheist. And he sent me back a note, said something to the effect of, you know, I don't really understand grace, but this is embodies it about as well as it could. And there was something in that, something in that embodiment of grace that has the capacity to win over human hearts. If you go through the history of the Christian church, uh, Rodney Stark has, has documented this. Why did it spread from this tiny messianic movement, you know, to within two centuries dominating much of, of the world? And it was because there was a community of care. They cared for the weak, the lost, the, the, the dispossessed, the people in sh the shadows of society. They took in the people who were, who were ill. They sacrificed for other people. And it was that set of actions over time that offered a better alternative and won people's hearts and eventually won them over the faith. And what worked then may work now. Peter Weiner, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Appreciate it very much. Peter Weiner is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a contributing writer at The Atlantic, the author of The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. Peter, thanks for coming back. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Take care. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow. We'll do this all over again.